guys, welcome to lesson 50. Wow, 50 lessons on the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, and here we are in Luke, specifically chapter six. Now, I'm just gonna make a disclaimer from the very beginning. Uh, our guys, you can hear this, you need to hear this. Like, I'm just not really good at this. You know, I do my best and I actually think when there is a Sunday when I'm actually at home, like I really try to check out. I mean, I don't think that's even a concern. I'm not like trying to work with my kids. I'm not, I don't try to bring that stuff home but my mind is always racing. And so I think even though, you ready for this? Even though uh, you take a Sabbath, that means you have to give all of your thoughts over to him as well. You have to give him all of your anxieties, all of your woes. And so like those are areas in my life, like I don't always do the greatest at. And so when I think about Sabbath, I wanna think, how can I get better at this? How can I get better at embracing what God originally intended Sabbath? Because here's the deal. When you go to Jerusalem, when you go to Israel, everybody takes the Sabbath. It's like they get mad at you for carrying a camera on your shoulder on Sabbath. Now, I don't need to get mad at people, but I want to be at this posture of just soaking up his presence on, on, on a day of rest. So this word Sabbath, okay, uh, a couple things. Just want to, let's get it out on the, on the open. Um, you know, again, none of this comes from here. Wiersbe just says, Sabbath is the sanct sanctity of the seventh day. Okay? It's a distinctive part of the Jewish faith. I think that's a fair statement. Uh, even as Christians, I, I don't think we even talk about the Sabbath much. Like, think about this. We, we talk about going to church. We got to go to church on Sundays, right? That's, that's our Sabbath. Wouldn't you guys agree? But when we actually talk about the components behind Sabbath, I don't know if we really understand it. Like to me, Sabbath is just, let's go to church. Let's not make a whole lot of food and let's go to Taco Bell. Like, I think I have an interesting, weird perspective of Sabbath. I think it's just going to church. And then whatever else we do afterwards, we watch some football. I think you get the point. So Sabbath is super distinct for the Jewish faith. Nehemiah 9.13 says, You came down on Mount Sinai and you spoke to them from heaven. You gave them impartial ordinances, reliable instructions, and good statutes and commands on Mount Sinai. Verse 14, you revealed your holy Sabbath to them. In other words, this is for you. You gave them commands, statutes, instruction through your servant Moses, okay? Uh, so I think this is pretty cool. Sabbath was clearly a sign between God and Israel. Sabbath means rest. One of those words that I'm not sure I really understand. <laughs> Like, I kind of get tired of the jokes and people say it all the time and I agree. Like, Kyle, when do you sleep? I don't know. Like, I don't say that with arrogance. It's because I don't understand the rest like I, I need to. And so it's, it's kind of along the lines of this rest of, remember after God created the earth? God created everything after six days. What did it say he did? He was done. He rested. A couple other components. Some of the rabbis, they taught, this is kind of interesting from a messianic perspective, that the Messiah wouldn't come back until the Sabbath was perfect. Well, good luck with that one. Okay, but I think that's an interesting, okay? Now, here's where it gets interesting. I don't know if you can help me, you guys, decide the difference, okay? I'm just gonna explain the difference. I don't know what I think about this. Sabbath is rest after work and how it relates to law, okay? Okay, Sabbath is rest after work and how it relates to the law. Okay, like it's important. That's, there's a law behind this. The Lord's day, which is what Christians would say, right? Think about this. We never, we don't say Sabbath. As much as we'd like to, we say it's the Lord's day. We, this is our day to serve the Lord. This is our day to worship the Lord. It's rest before work, okay, as it relates to grace. Okay, see the difference? Rest after work or rest before work relates to law or as it relates to grace. There's a little bit of a difference. We are, okay, uh, in regards to our day is really the first day of their week, right? Our Lord's day is the first day of their week. Because if you go to Israel, it'll totally mess you up. you be like, it's Sunday. What are we doing here? <laughs> like they're going. It's the first day of their calendar. Like let's go and off and running. So that's kind of your backdrop, a little bit of... Um, of Sabbath. Sabbath is, as one commentator said, it is literally one of Judaism's main institutions. It's almost like everything. I, I think this is a fair statement. It's like Sabbath, everything revolves around the Sabbath. 
And you go to Israel, I'll tell you what, you guys, that's, a, that's so true. I actually heard they implemented a law saying that this has to be implemented across the board. The problem is when you have tourism and people that don't care about the Sabbath and then everything's shut down. And so there's this tension of like, I can make money off of these people. It doesn't matter. Rest. And so there's this weird tension. So that's the backdrop of today's lesson in Luke 6, verse 1. On a Sabbath, okay, uh, which we would know at that time, what day would this be? Saturday. On Saturday. Or just, for, just as a framework, Friday night to Saturday, because that really throws you off when you're there in Israel, just FYI. It's as soon as sun sets, it starts. And I'm telling you, it starts. And so it's kind of like the weekend, like, you know, on the Friday afternoons, things are already picking up, you know, Sabbath is getting ready to shut down. So uh, it's not Saturday. It really is Friday night through Saturday. But then what do you think happens Saturday night? It goes back up again. So on a Sabbath, he, meaning Jesus, he passed through the grain fields. His disciples were picking heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands and eating them. Kevin, do you know anything about ag enough to describe what they're doing here? So like the wheat head that comes off and it's in a halt. What season is this? It'd be towards harvest. It has to be towards harvest, right? Because they're picking it. Okay, so keep going again here. But the head, it'd come off in the head and the hulls and everything. So they have to rub them in your hands to, to get the actual kernel of grain out to eat. So that's all it is. They're walking through and I, I just, I'm going to write this, these little phrases down. Okay. What, what are the disciples doing? Okay. The disciples are doing three things. Okay. They're picking, right? They're rubbing. And what else are they doing? They're eating. Anywhere in this description, are they doing this for profit? They're not doing this to make money. They're doing this to eat. So part of that backdrop is in verse two, it says, but some of the Pharisees says, why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Here's the craziest thing, you guys. The religious of all the religious should know that's not a law. This is not a law to actually eat. Now, this whole not lawful stuff, this is common language. Go to Matthew 12, 12. Okay, there are certain things that are not lawful, okay? This is not one of them. Matthew 12, 12 says, a man is worth far more than a sheep, so it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Okay, going to keep giving you a couple backdrops here. Matthew 19, verse 3. Some Pharisees approached him to test him and they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? What you're going to see is this language over and over, Matthew 22, verse 17, is that the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they're constantly coming up the lawful language. Okay, tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Everything that they ask has to do with the law. Matthew 27, verse 6, if you'll go there, Kevin. The chief priest took the silver and said, It's not lawful to put into the temple treasury since it is, this is Judas's, right? Blood money. Everything that they did was through the lens of the law. The craziest thing to me is if you go back to Luke 6, when they say in verse 2, Why are you doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? They're not doing anything illegal. But when you have a religious spirit, it's a constant state of criticism. Constant. It doesn't even matter if it's legit or not. And look, who hasn't ever done this in their local church? Right? Who hasn't ever just come up with all of these things of why you don't like this? Or do I like this? Or do I like what's being said? Or do I like how the building... I mean, it's this exhausting mentality of of, of, of uh, a religious spirit. And this is what Jesus says in verse three. Jesus answered them, haven't you read? And I, lo I love how Jesus counteracts. What does he do? He goes to the word of God. Haven't you read what David and those who were hungry, who were with him did when, when he was hungry? How he entered the house of God, verse four. And then he, what does he do? He took and he ate the sacred bread. And we know that's not lawful for any but the priest to eat. So they actually went and crossed the line. They actually crossed the line and said, this is against the law. Even, he even gave some to those who were, who were with him. Okay, so this is crazy. Kevin, can you go to 1 Samuel 21? Let's talk a little bit about the story. So first of all, do you see the big difference? It's clear that if you're not a priest, you're not supposed to eat a part of the sacred bread. Okay, that's an extreme case, but this is where Jesus even goes because it has to do with eating. Okay, if you'll go to, Kevin, if you would, 1 Samuel 21, verse 1. 
I'm going to go to the six verses, but I think this is important because Jesus always countered, counters the religious spirit with the word of God. David went to Ahimelech, the priest at Nob. Ahimelech was afraid to meet David. So he said, and why are you alone and no one is with you? Verse two. David answered Ahimelech, the priest, the king gave me a mission, but he told me, don't let anybody know anything about the mission. I'm sending you on or what I've ordered you to do. I've stationed my young man at a certain place. Verse three. Now, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. Verse four. The priest told him there's no ordinary bread on hand. However, there is consecrated bread. But the young men may eat it only if they've kept themselves from women. Keep it there, Kevin. This consecrated bread, you guys, uh, the show bread is what it's called. This is the show bread that we're talking about. John MacArthur says, the consecrated bread of the presence consisted of 12 loaves of bread baked fresh each Sabbath. And it can only be eaten by the priests. So how many did he ask for? Five loaves, right? Well, the showbread will always have 12. So I think that's kind of cool. And so the priest says, hey, look, man, you guys can eat it, but, you know, have you done anything with some women lately? And then in verse five, it says this. David answered him, I swear that women are, are, are being kept from us. As always, when I go out to the battle, <laughs> don't worry, we're good. The young men's bodies are consecrated, even on an ordinary mission. So, of course, their bodies are consecrated today. In verse 6, so the priest gave David the consecrated bread, for there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from the presence of the Lord. Whoa. And when the bread was removed, it had been replaced with warm bread. Now, Kevin, will you go to Leviticus 24, verse 5? I want to I make sure everybody understands the importance here. David and his men are hungry. The only people that are supposed to eat is priests. The bread is to be set out. I'm in Leviticus 24, verse 8. The bread is to be set out before the Lord every Sabbath as a perpetual covenant obligation on the part of the Israelites. And then in verse 9, and who does this bread belong to? It belongs to Aaron and his sons who are to eat it in a holy place for, watch this, it is the holiest portion for him from the fire offerings to the Lord. This is a permanent rule. So the priest at Nob, Ahimelech, gives David and his men the presence of God, the bread, the showbread, showbread that's only supposed to be for priests. And David asked for this and it was okay. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I think David and his men were hungry. They're given the bread and can you imagine if the priest was so arrogant, he'd be like, no, you can't have it. That's just for this. We're going to get into that. The Ahimelech, the priest of Nob, he didn't have a religious spirit. Whether he recognized David enough or whether he heard from the Lord, but either way, he gave it up. Part of the religious spirit, though, always holds on to legalism. And it has to be done this way, this way, and this way. And there's never any freedom in that. Now, if you go back to Levi uh, I'm sorry, Luke 6, verse 5, this is what Jesus says. After his disciples were what? They were picking, rubbing, and eating the grain. He says, look, the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus, that's, that's me, is in charge and is over, actually, the Sabbath that you want to protect. Kind of an interesting thought. He trumps all of the rules. He trumps all of the law. Jesus is in charge over everything everything. And for some weird thing, you guys, in the American church or in the church across the world, if we aren't careful, we begin to elevate traditions just as much as, as Jesus. And when you start doing that, can I just say this? You miss the whole point of Sabbath. You miss the whole point of, of rest. It becomes more about doing and doing and doing rather than in, in being. And that's part of my problem. I'm wired out of obedience of what I think to keep doing, but sometimes he's just like, dude, just relax and be. And sometimes I think we get that confused. We're more concerned about protecting the bread rather than giving the bread. Or even, can I say, eating the bread. We'd rather protect it rather than participate. And in verse 6 of Luke 6, okay, the scripture I think this is really important. Uh, before we go to verse 6, it says, The Son of Man is Lord of, of the Sabbath. Okay, now think about this. Sabbath laws, okay, what, what do they not restrict people to do? Think about this, okay? One of them is deeds of necessity. Again, this comes from John MacArthur. 
Okay, so deeds of necessity, that, that would fit into this category, right? So like, I, I, I need to eat right now, right? So deeds of necessity, I think would be a fair statement of saying, oh yeah, Kevin, can you go to Matthew 12, verse three and four? He says, haven't you read what David did when he and those who were hungry with him? What's it say in verse four? How he entered the house of bread, they ate the sacred bread, what is not lawful for him or those with him to eat for only for the priest. This is a deed of necessity. This was essential. This trumps the, uh, the Sabbath. Right? That makes sense. But we become so legalistic that we forget about just practical things. All right. Another, another component is the Sabbath laws do not restrict, this is cool, service to God. So service to God. So Kevin, if you go to Matthew 12, verse 5 and 6, right? Or haven't you read in the law that on Sabbath days the priests in the temple violate the Sabbath and are innocent? Verse 6. But I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Like when there's service to God and you give up of these things, sometimes those things have to trump, like you have to help somebody uh, because they need it. Like because God's asking you. So sometimes the, the, you're gonna trump it with the deeds of necessity and the service to God. And then number three, this is kind of an obvious one, but there's gonna be times where just simple acts of mercy flat out trump literally uh, whether you give medicine, whether you give healing. So now, Kevin, let's go to Luke 6, verse 6. So the acts of mercy, watch this. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And a man was there whose right, right hand, remember Dr. Luke, is always going to give you a little bit more detail. His right hand was paralyzed. doesn't say a man who had a hand paralyzed. His right hand was paralyzed in verse 7. It says the scribes and the Pharisees, they were just watching closely. Ah, is Jesus going to heal on the Sabbath? so that they could find a charge against him because surely you can't do anything. You can't show any act of mercy on Sabbath. And then it says in verse, uh, verse eight, but I love this. It says, but he knew their thoughts and he told the man with the paralyzed hand, get up. Why? Because he, he wanted it to be public. He wanted people to see he's going to actually heal on Sabbath. Get up, stand here. So he got up and, and he, he stood here. I love this. Christ, as one commentator said, he's not selective. He healed all who came to him. No, nope, not going to heal your right hand. No, nope, not going to heal your left hand. I mean, Christ is in the business of giving it away for free. But he knew their thoughts, right? And so Jesus said to them after he knew their thoughts, and that's kind of scary, you guys, that he knows all of our thoughts. So when you say you don't have a religious spirit, he knows what you're thinking. Luke 5, verse 22. Jesus replied to them, why are you thinking this in your hearts? Perceiving their thoughts. Like Jesus, Jesus knows. He knows exactly why the Pharisees, and so that's why he addresses this, right? He says this in verse nine, he knows their thoughts that they're just waiting for Jesus to mess up. And he says, I ask you, and don't you love, he uses the phrase, is it lawful? So he asks the religious the lawful question, and he asks them the best question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or do evil? That word to save life also really just means to heal life, to heal it or to destroy it. So in other words, what would you do on Sabbath? To do good or do evil? <laughs> and looking around, after looking around at them, <laughs> because I'm pretty sure they didn't have an answer. Uh, that's a trick question. I don't like this question. After looking around, he told them, stretch, he told the man with the right hand that was paralyzed, uh, yeah, paralyzed. He says, stretch out your hand. So this man, look, look at this image, you guys. I'm not saying this is the one, but stretch out your right hand. And he did, and his hand instantly, just by the touch, was restored. You see, the Son of Man invites all to the table. He invites, and I love this image that Mindy has here, he is the covering over all. Like, whether it's the tablecloth or his actual, uh, his robe, he is the, the covering that we need, and it's just a simple touch. But when you walk in a religious spirit, you're never open to experiencing a touch of God. You're never open because you're always worried about, am I doing this, this, and this, rather than just receiving. We become more about doing rather than receiving. And instantly, as soon as he stretched out his hand, his hand was restored. And in verse 11, it says, they, however, were filled with rage it's like they couldn't even rejoice that somebody was experiencing the goodness of God because they're so legalistic about getting stuck on you can't do acts of mercy, you can't serve God, you can't do deeds of necessity right now. It has to be X, Y, and Z. And they couldn't even enjoy. They're so mad. They were filled with 
rage. It's kind of a, a weird a weird response to a miracle, isn't it? I love what John MacArthur says. And well, first of all, the scripture says that they started discussing one another what they might do to Jesus. I'm pretty sure nothing. <laughs> oh, what can we do? How can we fix this situation? And so anytime you have a religious spirit, you know, like this context, there's this irrational hatred. They wanted Jesus humiliated. And you know what really it was? They hated being humiliated. They hated being called out. Kevin, can you go to Matthew 23, verse 6? They love the place of honor. This is the religious at banquets, the front seats in the synagogues. In verse 7, greetings in the marketplaces to be called rabbi by people. Like they wanted the recognition. And if they didn't get it, that word rage, it actually means senseless wrath. There's no point in what they're doing. When you have a spirit of religion, that's what begins to take over. They were furious. They couldn't answer Jesus's remarks, his reasons, his questions. And so they were mad. And so in verse 11, Kevin, I think this is important to understand. We, we talked about how Luke 4 really started the mission of the Messiah, right? It started off preaching the gospel. Then as, as we jumped into to Luke 5, we began to talk about uh, you know, how Jesus showed up and he wanted his disciples to continue to press in and trust him even, even when they, they wanted to quit. And then in verse 6, I think what's absolutely crazy is in verse 11, I actually think began the religious first Jesus game. I think it's right here. I think in the Gospel of Luke, we begin to see Jesus wasn't selective about who he serves and when. He wasn't caught up on, on the legalism. And so can I just ask a question? And this comes from uh, Joseph Matara about whether or not you or I have a religious spirit. Like, do we get excited when somebody gets healed or do we get mad that it's not done our way? So I just want to ask a couple, I want to make a couple questions, okay? So do you have a religious spirit, okay? I'm just going to write the words down, okay? There's 10 of these, all right? One of them is, is you just simply, and when I say you, I mean us. So, okay, do we have a religious spirit? When we judge other people simply by their appearance, that's a religious spirit. Okay, so when there's any form of judging just based on, oh man, can you believe this? Like, they wear jeans to church. Can you believe this? They wear a three-piece shirt. <laughs> I mean, it's like this religious spirit that begins just based on judging their, on their appearance. Okay, another one is, do you have a religious spirit? Maybe if you are trying to constantly earn God's love and his salvation. Maybe you judge others, but maybe you're always striving just to stay ahead to feel good. Okay, do you have a religious spirit? Do I have a religious spirit? Okay, when you or we try to conform to outward holiness with uh, no inward transformation. You know what that really looks like? An outer shell that has nothing in. So I'm just going to put outward appearance. Isn't that crazy? We judge everybody else's outside appearance. Why? Because we're always trying to make our outside appearance look good. You know, I think if we're not careful, we function in a religious spirit, which really means to me we're not embracing the Sabbath. Okay, and what I mean by is resting in the Lord rather than trying to earn it. Okay, does that make, I, th I think that makes sense. Speaks to my heart. Okay, number four here, okay. Uh, I'll just write the one word. You're always, I am always, we are always critical of other people's walk with the Lord. Like it's always this, you're judging the outside appearance and you're critical of their own walk. I'll tell you what, the church gets in some serious trouble when we're always functioning in that position. Now, this is an interesting one. I don't know if I always agree with all of this, but I think this is one of them just for your process. Your closest Christian relationships are based only on ministry activities. That makes sense? So your Christian friends are only, this is kind of interesting, based on what you do rather than constantly doing ministry just outside as well. Does that make sense? Like, I just think it's like we're only stuck in this role, but we're never open to ministering outside of this. I think that's a, what, what he's after here. 
Uh, so Christian friends, I'll just write that. That's kind of a weird one to look at like that way. But again, you don't have to agree with all of these, but just to give you an idea, do we have a religious spirit? One is you perform Christian duties, but you really have no hunger for God. So you just perform, but there's no desire. Like, yeah, I'm going to go through this motion, but if you don't have a hunger for the Lord, then it's just pointless. Okay. Um, <laughs> Number seven, you desire a position and honor in church more than honor from the Lord. You want a position among men. Again, not saying any of us experience this, but I think it's a good question. You relatively, you're rooted, your identity is rooted in the lifestyle of Christianity rather than in Christ. So your identity is in what you do rather than him, which is Pharisees and Sadducees. They get to wear the part, they get to play the part, but it's nothing to do with who they are in God. Okay, two more here, and you guys have been great. This, do you have a religious spirit? Do I have a religious spirit? You know about the truth of Jesus, and this is crazy, but not the way of Jesus. That one to me, I love. You know the truth, but not the way. What's the difference, Kevin? Uh, probably the just... You got it all up in your head, but you don't act for walk it out. You don't ever yeah. talk you, the talk, don't walk the walk. Yeah. yeah. Which I tell you guys, I think that's more of the church than we know. We interact with the church all over America. They can recite more scripture verses than you can ever imagine, but when you ask them to walk certain things out, you're like, get they tell you get lost. Again, we might be there too. Last one, you project righteousness, but inwardly you're filled with anger and, and resentment. <laughs> Let me just put it a different way. You have rage. <laughs> you have rage. You know, I have an inner spirit, a spiritual, uh, religious spirit, right? When you have rage. But I just think, you guys, for us, somewhere I fit in there, I can guarantee it. Somewhere something is that, and I'm like, okay, Lord, I need to work on that. And when I'm in this position right here, you know what happens? I never experience resting in the Lord. So I just want to close with Psalm 37, 7. When I live in those 10, I never get to experience Psalm 37, 7. I never get to experience be silent before the Lord and wait expectantly for Him. Do not be agitated by the one who prospers in his way, by the man who carries out evil plans. Don't worry about anybody else. Rest in me. Wait on me. I don't want to be the guy's mad that somebody's picking some grain in a field because that's not how we do it. I want to be the guys that are just in his presence <laughs> picking the grain. All right, guys, that's Luke 6. Again, there's a lot here um, I need to work on in my own life. And my prayer is that the Lord would highlight an area of you maybe you need to as well. Thanks.